There is a fountain who is a king. May that always be the testimony of this church. Amen? That of all the things that we do, of all the busyness, of all the programs, of all the outreach, of all the creative things, that that one message would always ring true. Come, come to the fountain. He is such a good, good king. Well, this morning's a very special morning for a number of reasons. Uh, there's no, actually no surprise. I've been teasing it for a couple weeks. I just wanted you here uh, for my son's baptism. That's really <laughs> pretty much it. That's what this is all about. Uh, no, a very exciting morning, and I'm sure you're uh, wondering just a little bit about how it's going to unfold. And so let's jump into it. We have been in the middle of a, of a church through the book of Ephesians and looking very intently week after week and seeing the way that the scripture presses us into the importance of meaningful membership within the local church. I want to start by reading uh, two verses actually out of the book of Hebrews uh, because they continue along this theme. Uh, but this morning's going to look a little different. Normally, I preach exegetically. We walk through a text. I apply it. I apply it. This morning, we're going to take kind of a holistic approach of where we've been and where God wants us to go. So listen as I read these two passages out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 23, and 25. It's on the screen. The author of Hebrews writes, writes Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And again in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. Will you pray with me? God, you are a consuming fire. You are our creator. You are our sustainer. And you are our savior. You have awoken us from the dead. You have transformed our hearts of stone into a heart of flesh. You are our king. You are our portion. We praise you. We delight to praise you. We come to your word to praise you. Oh, you're so good to us. Help us as a local church, First Baptist Bernie, to think rightly and well about what your word says we are to do together as the church, as the living temple. We want to glorify you. We want to walk worthy because you are worthy. Make our hearts right before you this day. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to read for you something that D.A. Carson wrote. He writes... I would like to buy $3 worth of gospel, please. <laughs> not too much, just enough to make me happy, but not so much that I get addicted. I don't want so much gospel that I learn to really hate covetousness and lust. I certainly don't so, want so much that I love my enemies, consider the church my family, and contemplate living my life on mission to a lost world. I want ecstasy, not repentance. I want transcendence, not transformation. I want to be liked by nice, forgiving, broad-minded people. But I myself don't want to love those from different races, especially if they smell. 
I would like enough gospel to make my family secure and my children well behaved, but not so much that I find my ambitions redirected or my giving too greatly enlarged. I would like three dollars worth of gospel, please. Without being too heavy handed, I do think it's a fair critique of our Christian culture to ask probing questions like, do we genuinely count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ? Did he not say all who follow after me must take up their cross and follow me? I mean, he, the son of God, suffered and died. Are we any greater than he? And I do think it's right also to ask certain questions of the church and to recognize that as society speeds up, as technology advances, as we become a very transient people, that we see a certain tendency within the church that as the church uses all of these tools and adjusts to the changing times, sometimes she loses her identity and becomes far too consumer driven. You know, the ideals of being a member of a church, belonging, being known, being committed like a family, rolling up our sleeves and doing the hard work even when times get tough, loving one another through thick and thin, even if it means holding each other accountable. Guys, if we're honest, our culture has by and large lost so many of these ideals. And just so you know, I'm not making this up. And stat after stat bears it out. I shared with you guys a most recent Gallup poll that just came out uh, last month that said for the first time in American history, less than 50% of Americans identify as having a church home. But here's what's even worse. Of those who consider themselves religious, only 60% say that they have a church now, by this, I don't mean that they just regularly attend. I mean, 40% of religious people say they don't even have a church they identify with. Because culturally, we've adopted the idea that I can have a personal relationship with Jesus and church is just optional. And so we as a church, we've been walking through the book of Ephesians and we've seen a completely different picture. We've seen that, that Jesus Christ, having purchased us from the dead, has now made us alive as a new third race of people. No longer Jew and Gentile, but now Christians, born again, alive from the dead. And he has made us into a living temple. Having a unity that the world longs to have, but can never have, only in Jesus Christ. And we are called to walk worthy. And as we've seen time and time again, what Jesus means by walk worthy is our love towards one another. That if we can't love and show unity towards one another, we will never be able to do it out there. And so he calls us to be patient and humble and gentle with one another. And something that I've been screaming this entire six weeks has been the local church is the gospel made visible. That all of these commands, they don't just float around in the air somewhere and you're just supposed to find random Christians that you're supposed to love. It always boils down to the local church 
It's the gospel made visible. In fact, Jesus left the local church as his final authority on earth. He could have appointed kings and governments, special groups of really, really, really smart people and said, well, you guys are the authority on the earth. But he didn't. He said us, this gathering right here, the local sons and daughters of the king, when we gather together, he gives us the authority. To borrow from Jonathan Lehman, oh, how often we think of the church as a cool social club with hobbies and service projects. Or one that I often hear is that church is a gas station so that you get spiritually filled during the week. But what these images miss is the inherent authority that Jesus has placed in the local church. A better image is one of an assembly. Sorry, of an an embassy. You can read it, don't listen to me. (laughs) An embassy is an institution that represents one nation inside of another nation always declaring the home interest to the the host nation. It protects its citizens of the home nation living inside of that host nation. So an embassy represents one kingdom in another place on the globe. So catch this, Jesus' kingdom is in heaven and it's coming one day in its fullness and entirety. And he has left us as ambassadors of his kingdom, representing his kingdom. And his established kingdom authority, his uh, uh, embassy, goodness, his embassy is the local church. That's the picture that the New Testament paints. The New Testament gives a host of images, a a family, a flock, a living temple, but also an embassy. So it's one thing for us to critique culture, but let's, let's get open and honest. Let's ask the question, how are we doing here at First Baptist Bernie in regards to our own membership culture? Now, I have no interest in airing our dirty laundry. No church is perfect. And I'm certainly not taking shots at past leadership. They were dealing with their issues. We're dealing with our issues. But the stats I want to share with you, I only share them to show that we struggle right here with the same struggles of meaningless membership that the culture does. Now, I also need to give you a disclaimer. Uh, Tracking church statistics is incredibly difficult, mainly because uh, we only take a head count in here. I I don't get a roll of who is here and who is not here. The only spot that we actually take any sort of membership is when you go to growth groups, okay? But I propose this to you. It's safe to say that we have a problem of members coming in the front door and leaving out the back door. If we just look at some pre-COVID statistics over a five-year period of time, we had 207 people join our church. Praise God for that. 207 people coming in the front door. That means the roles grew by 207. And yet during that same period of time, weekly worship attendance fell by 135 and growth groups fell by 63. How does membership role grow by 207 but less show up on a weekly basis? Meaningless membership. We've tried to get a handle on this and tackle this at points in the past. In 2016 and 17, we did a database cleanup of the roles and removed 1,200 members, many of whom were dead. We cleaned those off the roles in an attempt to do better at this. We currently have 1,900 plus members. 
Now I want you to put yourself in my shoes, okay? I'm the brand new pastor of a church with 1,900 people. And God's word says, I will stand before him on judgment day and give an account for everyone under my care. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they, uh, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And then six weeks after me getting here, COVID hits. Okay? And COVID just like was, was a pressure cooker. Okay? If you are disorganized before COVID, guess what? So you know the kind of questions I'm asking as I come in. How do we care for our people? And who are our people? Well, we care for our people from, in growth groups. All right, great. Of those 1,900 plus members, how many of them are actually connected and attached to a growth group? Well, look at the statistic. 38% have attended a growth group in the last year and 30% in the last six months. Again, meaningless membership. I need to tell you something else incredibly important. I understand that the front door to a church is through preaching and music. Okay, people check us out all the time online and they ask the question, did I like the preaching and did I like the music? Okay, that is the front door to a church. But catch me, hear me on this because every church statistic bears this out. A church only becomes sticky you only stay and get rooted in a church whenever you join a growth group. Amen. Whenever you join that small group. Otherwise, here's the deal. Every pastor gets old. Tells the same jokes, the same story, the same rhythm. You can only listen to me for so long before you eventually go, eh. Okay? So here's the press. We understand the Christian culture is towards meaningless membership. And I've explained to you some of the situation here that that disorder and lack of meaningful membership exists right here. And we've just spent six weeks walking through Ephesians talking about church matters. So what are we gonna do about it, guys? Are we gonna be hearers of the word? and not doers of the word? What are we going to do about it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Right now, the deacons all across uh, the aisles are gonna be passing out what I am proposing to you called covenant membership. The staff, the church council, a special ad hoc committee has been working for the past eight months. Deacons, since last fall, we've been talking about this and trying to get organized. And you are seeing it today for the very first time. Okay? There is a word on the front that I need you to hear. In fact, I'm gonna demand, because it's being passed out, I'm gonna demand that you say it back to me. Everyone say the word proposed. Proposed. Guess what that means? It's not final, okay? This is proposed. This is the very first time you're seeing it. We plan on having lots of town halls. We plan on letting you look through it. We plan on letting you pick every word apart and come and say, it shouldn't be that word. It should be this word, okay? We can have all of those discussions. Now, let's, uh, I need you to answer this question for me, too. Am I asking you to sign anything today? Everyone shout as loud as you can, no. No, that would be silly. Absolutely silly. Don't even ask that question. Of course you're not signing anything today. We're gonna walk through this this summer, have lots of town halls, and once an appropriate time comes, we will talk about 
signing and moving into that sort of thing, okay? But here's all I'm trying to do. Hear my heart. I'm trying to apply God's word to us and lead us to change our church culture, okay? And we're gonna do that by two ways. The first is just be upfront with our membership expectations. Just be upfront with our membership expectations. And you can see those right here. The membership covenant, the first section, see the blue title, it says, my commitment to First Baptist Bernie. And then there are five simple subcategories there, okay? Attendance, growth, service, giving, and unity. Now, I fully expect you to take this home, for you to devour it, for you to think through it again, for you to pick apart every word in that regard. But I want to simplify a few things for us this morning, okay? Just simplify a few things for us, because what I'm trying to tell you is that we just want to be up front with our membership expectations, okay? Look at, look at the screen, Go ahead and flip to the next. Look at these four things, okay? So whenever it comes to unity and whenever it comes to personal growth, you understand those things. All right, when we talk about being a member of the church, there are basically four asks that we're asking you as you join First Baptist Bury. The first is that you would regularly attend, okay? No one's taking a specific role. We're asking you to be big, boys and girls, keep yourself accountable, but you know when you join a church, the plan and the good for you is that you would regularly attend. The second thing is that you would join a growth group, okay? This doesn't mean that, that once you go to one growth group, you're married there for the rest of your life. Absolutely not. You can try out multiple growth groups. But again, I want you to get plugged into the inner connectings of the church. The third is that you would find a spot to serve. We walk through this, right? That God has gifted you with spiritual giftings and you are called to serve back to the body as a whole. That we are strong and we are mature when you find your spots to serve. And it's our job to do a good job of providing opportunities to serve so that you can use your gifts. So we have vacation Bible school coming up, right? Uh, you, we need people to be greeters and to pass out coffee in uh, the plaza between services. Uh, there's youth group and children's group. There, there are local mission partners that we have specifically for the purpose of you being able to use your gifts and get plugged in. And then the fourth thing is that you would give, that you would give regularly to the church. You know, we operate and function. We collect our monies for the purpose of doing missions and ministry together, okay? This doesn't mean, I'll let you know, I have a personal policy that I don't check anyone's giving, okay? I don't look at your giving. In fact, when we get generous donations to the church, I write a specific letter detailing thank you for that incredibly generous donation. But it's my personal policy so that I don't show any sort of favoritism, all right, so that I love everyone, that I just don't look at anyone's specific giving. But these are our four upfront asks of what it means to be a faithful member of a church. You say, but yeah, pastor, I don't want to join a growth group. Well, that's okay. You can continue to be a regular attender, okay? But we th we're not trying to be legalistic about anything, but we firmly believe that what is best and most healthy for you and for the church is for membership to include a growth group. And so we're just gonna ask for that up front. We're gonna say this is what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Bernie. Now, secondly, okay, we're gonna be, so one, we're gonna be up front with what it means to be a member, but secondly, when you become a covenant member, you are automatically a part 
of what we're calling covenant care. Covenant care. Something I don't have a lot of time to detail, but I will in the few weeks that follow up, is basically what it means for a church to provide shepherding care for its members. Okay, Jesus used the image that he was the good shepherd. And my title, our titles are pastor, which is the Latin word for shepherd. Okay, it's just all throughout the scripture that a pastor is supposed to be a shepherd, that I am supposed to know, to feed, to protect, and to lead our congregation. So let's be, let me state something really obvious that me and my pastoral team cannot know 1,900 people. You get that? Okay? I can't know you. I can't provide proper shepherding care. So here's what I'm proposing. Every family unit that opts into covenant care will be assigned a deacon, okay? A deacon whose responsibility is to be an extension of the pastors, the shepherding arms that get to know you, that calls you once a quarter to pray with you and just check on you to see how things are going. Now, this will mean that we will need to add some new deacons in order to keep those flock sizes small enough that it's appropriate and healthy for the deacon body, okay? And we're going to be proposing that next week. We're going to begin to announce we're starting to take deacon nominations. And I'm going to be preaching a sermon that specifically highlights what it means to be a deacon, why we have deacons in the Bible, Okay, and all of what that means. And again, calling you just once every three months that says, hey, how are things going in your family? How can I pray with you? Are, is your growth group going okay? Is there anything I can help you with? That's simple. This organization system will highlight us getting to know our members on a personal level as well as highlighting the value of prayer. This heightened care allows the church to meet its commitments towards its members to, and to kindly, consistently encourage its members to strive to meet their God-given membership commitments as well. Okay? So again, I and the leadership have been working on this for eight months. But you're just seeing this for the very first time. So what are we asking you to do? Take it home. Process it. Pray about it. Again, we'll have plenty of town halls where you can ask questions. We've given you an FAQ sheet that hopefully answers your questions, but I'm sure we missed a few. And so think critically, because this is very important about who we are going to be as a church. And once the right time comes, once we've had enough conversations, then we will be asking all members to opt into covenant membership and covenant care, okay? Again, to be a covenant member means you get covenant care. And remember, because of our inflated roles, there will be many non-active members who won't even be aware of this entire process that we've been talking about meaningful membership. So pastor, if I don't opt into covenant membership, are you going to remove my existing membership? No. But I'm asking you. In fact, I'm pleading with you to help me change our membership culture. Pastor, I've been a, church, a member of this church for 30 years. How dare you question my loyalty and commitment to this church? Guys, I wouldn't dare question your loyalty or commitment to this church. Not in the least bit. Listen to me, there is a core 
that exists in this church. And the majority of that core is of the older population. And you grew up knowing what it meant that church was family and to be committed and to give and to serve, okay? Did you actually know, someone sent me a picture of this, that they used to print covenant membership in the Baptist hymnal? Do you know that? In the 1956 Baptist hymnal, there is a covenant membership. I am, th- this is not a new idea. This has long been passed down through church history, okay? So what I'm saying to you, I'm not questioning your loyalty. What I'm begging you, what I'm asking you is help me lead. Help me lead the next generation as culturally this generation does not know what it means to commit, to dig in, to be a meaningful member. Help me lead. And I need you to do that by example. I need you to do that by example so that we can teach the next generation and so that we can recapture something important that has been lost. Now in conclusion, the way I wanted to close this service is I wanted you to enter into a time of prayer with me. So it would be a little longer than normal, but I want you to close your eyes, bow your head right now. And I want you to spend some moments. The first thing I ask you to pray for is yourself. Will you pray for yourself and how you view church membership? Will you be honest with the Lord? Has his word not convicted you? And now will you pray for our church? Will you pray for our church culture? And what it means for us to know one another, to shepherd one another, to bear one another's burdens. Would you pray for me and my leadership? That God would give me the ability to listen. To hear from him and from you. Would you pray that God would give me the ability to communicate with clarity and to think clearly and rightly? Would you pray for our deacon leadership? For the new ones that we need? servant leaders that rise up from within the congregation to help shepherd. Would you pray for the existing deacon leadership? Father, give them strength. So many who have served so well for so long. And finally, would you pray for a unity within our church congregation? Lord Jesus, we never want to take for granted this magnificent, beautiful truth 
that we call the local church. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Help us to walk worthy of you. Help us to surrender and lay down our rights for the good of your kingdom and your name. We want to be your embassy. We humble ourselves before you, King Jesus. For you are worthy. You are worthy. You have saved us. You've called us to yourself. You've changed our hearts. You've given us a light to shine. You've given us a unity and a bond all across this room that can only be described as you. Give us more. Help us more. We want to walk worthy of you. We want to go where you want us to go. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.